Welcome to Leaders of Tomorrow Season 10. It's been 10 seasons of empowering small businesses such as yourself and hand-holding and guiding you in your growth journey. I'm Sunanda Jaya Seelan. Here on the show, we're continuing to count down to the Leaders of Tomorrow Awards with a special showcase of India's biggest unicorns. What makes them tick? What makes them who they are? We bring you a deep dive into some of the best-known names across the country. On the show tonight, two such names. First up, is with Anant Narayan, serial entrepreneur, and his Mensa brands. Also in focus tonight is Black Buck. My first conversation tonight is with Anant Narayanan. I sat down with him uh, to talk about Mensa Brands. Of course, our viewers will know him as uh, the person and the face and the name really behind popularizing uh, Mintra. I caught up with him on Mensa. I spoke to him about what it means to have built this business ground up. I asked him also about what this unicorn boom really means for India's small businesses and about the importance of creating a good work culture. Listen. In. So when you're looking at a business, yep. you said that you are looking at the founders because for you it's a partnership. But beyond that, yep. how critical is it for small businesses to have a very good second and a third rung? What's the biggest challenge really when it comes to perhaps hiring or really skilling that second and third rung? Yeah, so businesses? I would say firstly it's attracting the right kind of people. And I think a lot of small businesses struggle with it. I think one thing by the way that I've learned through my Mintra, Medlife and now Mensa journeys is in order to attract great talent, you need to have two things. One. You need to have a culture where people become owners in the business, right? So you have real ESOPs and you actually are, you feel like you're part of the mission and vision of what we're trying to do. And I think many small businesses struggle with that, right? You actually want, I mean, if you talk to anyone at Mensa, right, I think one of the things we speak about is founder's mentality, right? Which is, you know, you have to feel like a founder, you have to feel like an owner, right? Only then do you sort of give your best. I think creating that culture is important and I think people struggle with that. And that is partly commercial, which is how much of the company you're willing to give away. Okay. But partly also, in my mind, just a culture and a mindset saying they need to do that. So that's one. Second is, I think some skills are harder to hire than others, right? Whether it's tech, performance marketing, etc. So I think having a reputation for developing people over time mm -hmm. and for them to have a career path is important. That's why I think talent comes. So those would be the two big ones in my mind. Okay. Uh, I want to take a step back and yeah. talk about just what it means to be a D2C brand in India. The top two or three things through this interview that you want for our entrepreneurs to understand, if they are in, in the D2C space, right. what have been the biggest challenges for you? How have you turned them around to your learnings? Yeah. And what do you want to tell them? So I think, firstly, it is the best time to be a digital first brand in India. I think the next 10 years, I think there'll be multiple, forget Mensa for a minute, there'll be multiple large brands that get built in all these spaces, in fashion, beauty, home, and others, right? And the reason is simple. We have distribution, right? We actually have uh, GDP per capita continuing to go up. We have, by the way, people who at least do research on brands and at least have a view of the brands because they have access and data is so cheap, right, in the country. So I think there's gonna be a bunch of brands that get built. So this is the best time if you're an entrepreneur to build brands in India. I think that's number one. Number two is brands need to have meaning and purpose. So I think if you're an entrepreneur trying to build a brand, think about what is the customer connect. And the customer connect cannot only be functionality. It has to be something more than functionality. Your, your brand has to have some purpose, right? So think a little bit about how are you connecting with consumers and why are they coming to you? And it can't only be I'm selling a, a cheap shirt, right? It has to be something more. So I think that's the second, right? And the third I would say is, I think think global, think big. I think India has always had a history of exports. We've sort of exported, we've, we've been large suppliers to Zara, to H&M. Why can't you create brands that go global? Mm. I would say if you're an entrepreneur today, building a brand for the next 10 years, why can't you build a global brand? Because you can sell and distribute through Amazon, right? You can, through many of the other channels, you can go D2C and sell outside India. Why don't you build global brands? So I think best time in the world, uh, in the next 10 years in India, I think it's one of the best places to be, to build brands, mm. right? 
Uh, so I would feel very bullish, right? Uh, for, for anybody listening to this interview. Okay, uh, I wanted to come back to the piece that we were discussing on funding. Yep. Uh, but talk about the fact that in just six months time, you became a unicorn. And was that always something that was, you know, you, you wanted to achieve? And how did that come about in such a short period of time? Yeah, so yeah. firstly, by the way, my view is, I think unicorn as a term, I'm not like a particularly big fan of. I think valuations are fine. Firstly, we should focus on value creation. Yeah. I think if you build a great business, mm -hmm. You build it profitably and you can grow it. I think investors want to come to you, right? And because I think they eventually see a return on their investment, right? So I think firstly, the focus should be on building great businesses and creating value. And I think valuation is a outcome that you may or may not influence. It's market dependent, it's investor dependent. You can't influence all of that. What you can influence is can you build a great business? So we're very focused on building a great business. I think, frankly, we're building Mensa for the next 50 years, right? So I think when you turn unicorn, what happens, et cetera, are all immaterial. What we're trying to do is can we, I think success for us is in five years, if you're sitting and having this interview, if there are five to 10 brands that have become household names by working with Mensa, that would be success, oh. right? So that's what we're trying to do. I'm going to, to look forward right? to that interview and I'm going to put it down and then hold you to that. Uh, let me come back to talking about valuations though and this is my last couple yeah. of questions. Uh, what's your view really on the fact that you know, there was a period when you saw industry and the market was flush with funds and right. now commentary seems to be that most VCs are shying away from investing. How, sitting where you are, how are you seeing things? So look, I've been in this for a long time. Yeah. I think yeah. all boom and bust cycles are, I mean, it's a cycle, right? We've had 11 year bull run in the public markets. Yeah. So eventually it will come down. Mm -hmm. And I think that's normal and it's par for the course. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's point number one. Point number two is, uh, I would say there's always money for businesses that actually are creating value. It may be harder to get, but there's always money. So there's never a time when there is zero liquidity in the market and people are not able to raise money. Okay. So I don't think that happens. Okay. So I think even today, I would feel quite bullish because over the next 10 years, India will build great businesses. And I think where else will the global capital come to, right, I think. So it's our moment. And I think we should continue to be quite bullish. Only thing I would say, by the way, is in order to be less capital markets dependent, so you're less cycle dependent, you should build more sustainable businesses. And what do I mean by that, right? If you are burning a lot of money, then you're constantly depending and timing the market, which is very hard to do. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand, you create sustainable businesses, then you're less capital markets dependent. You will go through an 18 month cycle, which is hard, mm -hmm. and then markets will come back, and then you'll raise money at the right time. However, if you're burning a lot of money, then I think you're more capital markets dependent. So I think building sustainable businesses over time I think it's going to be important to ride out these cycles, right? Okay. Uh, so then before we let you go, um, the fact that I understand you're an avid reader. I do, I do. Um, I think books are an easy way to learn. And I think um, it started off during my McKinsey days because I had a lot of flights and you would start to read books. But uh, I read all sorts of books. Um, I read some nonfiction, I read some fiction. So I like What are books. you reading at the moment? I'm reading a book on the PayPal Mafia, uh, which is... By the way, a company that started in Silicon Valley wasn't as successful as one would say, maybe a Google and a Facebook and so on were. But I think the alumni of PayPal went on to found great companies, right? Whether it was Tesla, yeah. whether Peter Thiel started a whole bunch of different things, David Sachs, all of that. So I thought that was very interesting because they created a very high performance culture where the initial set of 50, 60 people, most of them turned out to be great entrepreneurs. So that, that was quite interesting. Is this love of reading something that you're passing on to your kids? And I'm curious to understand, your oldest, I think, would be entering college is yep. entrepreneurship somewhere in the in, in, in our blood, so, in our I genes. Mean, I have three kids, Nantara, Shreya, and Arya, and um, I hope they become entrepreneurs. I think it's a, it's a great time for them to go start something. No idea what they're going to do. The oldest is into liberal arts. All three of them enjoy reading. My wife enjoys reading as well, so I think we're all big readers. Okay, so my last question to you is, through this answer, if there's one piece of advice that you would want to give them if they were looking at the field of entrepreneurship, what would you want to tell them? I think start early, take risks. Mm -hmm. I think the next 10, 20, 30 years, I think it's very optimistic. If I look back at my sort of experiences, I would say I should have started earlier. Uh, and I think it's a great time to take risk and build businesses. I think it's always better to be a job creator than go take a job. So I think it's, it's, it'd be wonderful if they actually go and be entrepreneurs. Thank you so much, Anand. Thank you. Fascinating entry. Thank great. you so much. I'm going to slip into a short break. On that note, when we come back, our second unicorn in focus tonight is Black Buck from the logistics space. Do stay tuned. Back in just a moment.
Welcome back with us here in Leaders of Tomorrow. Tonight, we are continuing our unicorn focus. My second unicorn in focus tonight is Black Buck. In this conversation tonight with logistics giant uh, Black Buck, I caught up with Rajesh Yabaji. I spoke to him about really the logistics space, some of the trends, how the sector is changing, and also what small businesses should be keeping their eye on. Listen in. have a few competitors if I can really call them that who perhaps are doing more intra-city yeah. and that's also an equally big challenge that needs to be solved yes. and as a trend that if you can call that out to really talk about perhaps your views on that market as well and how that's perhaps changing. Yeah. So I think um, from an overall logistics industry trends perspective right I think the last I would say three to four years were phenomenal like phenomenally different than the previous years right. We started the company in the year 2015, right? When we started the company, the smart, the, the internet and smartphone penetration amongst truck operators was like 30-35%. Yeah. Drivers was like 6-7%. 2022, as we speak today, driver smartphone penetration is 80%, owner smartphone penetration is 100%. That's one big change. Second big change is that 2019 government, government made electronic tolling mandatory, yeah. right? The trust with online payments, the trust with saying that I receive a load online, I'll get my payment, I'm transacting online, is it safe? All those issues, right, have probably reduced by like 10x because they have organically started transacting on something like toll first, right? So these two big changes, right, are have changed the mindset of the truck operators, right? I, I would say that is one. So mindset of truck operators has changed like, I would say 100 times to the, from 2015 to 2022. Mm -hmm. Second thing which has essentially happened is that in, in multiple ecosystems, right, let's say enterprises adopting technology systems, truck operators having smartphones, right, warehousing systems having technology, like, so multiple ecosystem players across the logistics industry have started adopting technology. So it has become very easy to integrate data systems with a particular, you know, entity, push data, pull data, a lot of data has actually come, you know, sort of online. That, ha that has sort of helped like everybody to do business in a much more easier way, sure. right? So I would say that these two big trends, which is like, you know, leading to more disruptions and more innovations becoming easy and possible, right? I think 2022, those things are like happening much more easily and lucidly compared to what it was three, four years back. Rajesh, we're in the 10th edition of the Leaders of Tomorrow. And uh, as part of our 10th edition, we are calling out the big events, the big trends, the big entrepreneurs and the big companies to watch for. Since we've been talking about the trends, I want to talk about events. And one of the events that uh, has occurred recently in your life is the fact that you turned Unicorn in July of last year. So congratulations on that. What did achieving that Unicorn tag really mean for you? More uh, responsibility. Okay. Uh, and also broadly, that fundraise milestone happened in a timeline where uh, we saw our scale on the platform had jumped like about uh, 20 times over the last two years. Okay. And, uh, and the problem we're solving is a very tough problem. Yeah. And the realization that, uh, you know, uh, the kind of uh, engagement, the kind of traction, the kind of like, you know, customers we have on our platform, I think, you know, the responsibility that this is the only way it can get solved and getting more committed to it, I think that's what essentially probably I would say happened in uh, the July timeline. Okay. Another event I must talk and must discuss with you, of course, is the pandemic. And I understand that you saw nearly uh, over 60% dip in your revenues. And that was true of most businesses and all businesses, I can say. So my question to you really is, what did that period really mean for you? You know, how did you, it, it has been it has been challenging for all businesses, but how did you manage that? And what was that period like for you? So I think, uh, um, you know, uh, April was like zero revenue. <laughs> okay, April of 2020. 2020 was like zero revenue, yeah. right? I think that was the first time where our monthly revenue was zero, right? And uh, I think not only me, a uh, lot of us as entrepreneurs had like very tough times. 
uh, you know, uh, during that phase. Uh, for us, I think uh, what was really, you know, first thing was very important was that all of us were into the survival, you know, yeah. uh, uh, sort of a tactics, right? Not financially, right? Because you were doing well. Uh, so you are doing well, but if revenue becomes zero, financially also it becomes a survival problem. Because what you are, in April 2020, when people said that it's COVID, none of us really knew whether it's going to be three months, six months, 10 months, 12 months, the lockdown is going to continue till when, right? But did you have a sufficient bank balance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we, we yeah. like when we were even fundraising during the last year, we obviously were capitalized. Bridge capital, years. and I was just going to three come to four that. years, yeah, okay. right? So, so we always had capital. Capital was not the problem, but the uncertainty in what the business would look like, what would happen to the business, was like, you know, infinite, right? So, the first thing was survival. Uh, you know, tactics sort of came in that we need to survive for long to be able to create this chain. Number one, right? Number two was that few business models which we were doing pre-COVID to post-COVID, right, which were not working in the pre-COVID era, right, started showing a lot of green shoots, right, in the post-COVID era. SME business, right, was one area, SMEs, serving SMEs, serving brokers, serving transporters, was one big area which never really took off for black buck in the pre-COVID era. In the post-COVID era, with both the digitization impetus on the truck owner side and SMEs coming digital, right, and we didn't have anything to do, so we actually relaunched our SME experiments, right. So COVID actually gave birth to the entire rapid scaling marketplace, which you today see as having 10% of India's loads, right? Actually COVID gave birth to that, right? Number two was truck owners, as I was mentioning to you, right? Because 2019 was the fast tag, you know, mandation wave. COVID was another way where, you know, everything was happening online, right? So the trust with online ecosystem actually probably, you know, as I was mentioning, went 10x, right? So that helped us start creating newer and newer, like, you know, services, you know, online for the truck operators and their acceptance of those services actually was much higher, right? So I would say these are the two like trends we saw which we were able to capitalize and, and ride upon. Okay. The reason I asked you that uh, capital question is because would you say it's very crucial for a small business or any entrepreneur to really have that kind of financial, you know, um, sort of an anchor? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and how do you ensure you're sort of maintaining that? I think, I think uh, uh, I would say there are two things. Yeah. One is, uh, first is on the kind of business you're running, right? Is that really producing a contribution margin flows to the business from which you are able to pay your growth cost or your wage bills, right? And if you can be in a business which is giving you predictable contribution margin in your business, right? The, the, I would say the tension of really being well capitalized goes down by probably, you know, okay. one third, number one. Number two is, when you are really growing, right, at like, you know, different pace, right, what is really important is that, you know, and that depends on business to business, right, we as a company always have felt comfortable to have always at least 24 months of cash, right, but I think on an average we've always maintained 36 to 48 months, right, so I think that anchor is like, you know, very important. So I would say having a bedrock of capital which ensures that you have a 36 to 48 month runway is very critical and second thing is, in a business with predictable contribution margin always helps you like, you know, a ward off any uncertainty in the business environment. Okay, fantastic. Um, so let's then perhaps end today's interview. I know there's so much more to discuss, but in the interest of time, one piece of advice that you have for our entrepreneurs based on your personal and your professional journey. First, I think build for the right reasons. Because while you're building, a, you know, a startup, solving a problem, what is, because it's going to be series of ups and downs and in those downs I think the only thing which will remain with you is the reason you are in this journey right so if you start with an intent and the right reason you're starting up right I think that will take you like really really wrong otherwise the journey will become very difficult I think so so I think the reason and the motivation to start has to be like very 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 real number one number two I would say is that, uh, you know, uh, while you are building the journey, like, and like you get series of few successful milestones, right? There'll be a lot of distractions, right? Distractions around a, a way to capital raise, distraction around, you know, building scale versus building profitability, what to sacrifice, right ways of, you know, building the business, wrong ways of building the business. I think sticking to always fundamentals, right? And because generally an entrepreneur knows the truth of his business, right? Okay. Sticking to fundamentals and building the business in the right way, regardless of what distractions, you know, we have uh, while we're building the business on a long, on a very long duration, I think sticking to fundamentals is going to be very important. I think these two are my pieces of advice, which have helped me 
during you know anything which Blackbook has gone through in the last seven years. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Rajesh. Thank you. Out of time on tonight's conversation. If you have any feedback for us, do let us know. Our contact details on your screens as we speak. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.